session, past president of KMA, Mr. P. Prem Chand. Sir, may I request you to escort our speaker for the session, Mr. K. Nanda Kumar, the president and CEO of Sun Tech Business Solutions Private Limited. A hearty welcome to both the gentlemen here. Mr. Prem Chand, the past president, is currently a management consultant and advisor to various corporates like Nita Gelatin India, advisor HR at Rajagiri Hospital. And he will now take over the session. I request Ms. Nirmala Lili to present a bouquet, our managing committee member to present a bouquet and welcome our speaker to the session. A very warm welcome to Mr. K. Nandakumar, who's uh, heading Sun Tech Business Solutions Private Limited. And he is here to share his views on sustaining the global Indian. Good afternoon, one and all. I am sure after a heavy lunch, this session is going to be a bit difficult, but I am sure Nantakumar will keep all of us awake. Of course, I can never afford to cl close my eyes because a lot of eyes are watching on me, so I have to be certainly awake. So, <laughs> so we have much of time. My dear professional friends, uh, students, ladies and gentlemen, the topic of this session today is sustaining global Indian, and the speaker as you know, is Mr. Nanda Kumar, who is currently the CEO and Managing Director of SunTech Technologies and Company, which had gained a global attraction. The very fact that SunTech, a homegrown company, is up there on a global scene, there is no better person than Mr. Nanda Kumar, its founder and leader, to give us the necessary gyan on the subject. Breaking through the cauldron of resistance to reach the global scenario is one thing, but to sustain requires completely a different set of uh, competencies. This is where you have to take the best in you to adhere to the global standards and to put in systems and processes in order for a company to be a global leader. At an, at an individual level, Indian professionals have gained much competencies to sustain the top of the leadership. Prime examples are Indian doctors, IT professionals and management professionals doing well in developed nations, including the USA. When it comes to corporate, to do so, it is taller order, and that is what we would now hear from Mr. Nanda Kumar. His own company's example itself would be something for Indian startup to emulate. Mr. Nanda Kumar, founder SunTech Business Solutions Private Limited, serves as the CEO and president. Mr. Kumar has uh, conceptualized, designed, and developed SunTech's flagship product, SIU, TBMS. He has successfully created and led SunTech as a highly successful transaction-based billing product company. His extensive knowledge of billing and customer care and the international telecommunications and banking and financial service industries have helped SunTech extend the product line successfully across various industrial verticals. He has more than 20 years of experience in management, technology, and software engineering. Mr. Kumar holds an MBA in finance and a postgraduate degree in physics. Without much ado, let me make the space for him to address you. What I understand is he would be taking about 15, maximum 15, 20 minutes. I would prefer to have a more Q&A session, and I'm sure all of you would certainly be ready, should be ready with questions to take it forward for the rest. Over to Mr. Nandakumar. Thank you very much. Can you hear me? Yeah. All right. So it's a difficult session because you're just after the lunch, and definitely it's my, I will try to keep you awake. Um, to put this in context, we're definitely going to have another uh, session after this to talk about the past, so I'm not going to delve into the past history of what we did. Um, but I just need to correct, it's not 20 years, now it is 29 years since I started Sorry. the journey. <laughs> so it is almost 1990 since we started uh, leaving a public sector job. Um, but uh, many of the aspects which discussed today morning is very um, I had the great opportunity to apply it in some form or other. Uh, the beginning was very humble. I mean, I started all by myself as a one-man enterprise. I uh, wrote the entire software by myself uh, for the billing system for Indian Telecom. So which uh, replaced the entire billing system in the country in about close to about 300 old telecom operating units. Uh, this is between 90 to 95. 
just to put uh, fast forward, the 95 to about, uh, about 99, I was trying to sell this in the international market with no success, but the first success I got was in Europe. And against competing with one of the largest uh, provider at that point of time and replacing their system. Then um, one of the important things which you talked about just before the session was the ability to learn. So the Indian context gave you such a phenomenal diversity. Once you overcome that kind of uh, environment, anything in the world is, is a cakewalk for you. Because we always, I drive all over, the, all, all over the world. If you can drive in Indian roads, definitely you can drive anywhere in the world, right? You all agree with that, people who drive. So the same thing holds good in our uh, practice too. So that is what has happened. Um, then one of the important things was the previous uh, point about the learning aspect. So when we saw this in the telecom, this is all in telecom industry, and what, when you saw that, we thought, why is it only applicable for telecom? The learning from that, the, the aspect which we've been doing for the telecom was providing them the pricing and billing system for all the calls, which is high volume, very complex pricing rules, and very personalized systems, and which was 10 years back in India. Um, I don't know how many of you in this audience will recollect the PCO days and you know all that, where switching or the pricing mechanism was inbuilt in the switch. And we had to abstract that out into a centralized platform to do a global billing. And that was the kind of transformation that industry has gone through. But when we looked around the whole uh, world, every other business or industry is still in that primitive stage in going banking. So we thought, why don't we apply this, the same thing into other industries so that we took, abstracted that learning from the telecom and took it to um, the banking industry and we created the first product in the world, especially for that particular space in banking. It was not a space existing, this is what we, uh, the, again, going back to the learning which Mr. Um, uh, they just talked about, uh, is finding the gaps, not the fielders. So we thought nobody else is serving, otherwise there was a wonderful um, conversation, I mean, a book about it called Blue Ocean Strategy. I happened to read that. That tri uh, triggered me to think in those directions. So instead of fighting in the red ocean with all the big giants, we took that learning in 2000 and created a platform for banking uh, uh, industry as a concept called relationship-based pricing. What it does is nothing uh, um, great, except but it's a... Uh, completely revolutionary in their context. Instead of pricing your product just based on a customer, one product, price it based on the customer's context. That means the customer-centric pricing. So the whole dynamics need to be changed. It was, a, uh, we got some of the phenomenal organization in the world, uh, the top uh, three or four of the top 10 banks in the world, we could sign up in a matter of five to six years. But it took about six years. But then the journey continued and uh, we uh, serve almost about 60 to 80 banks globally. All of them are global deployment. We operate in almost about 50, 50 to, 50 to odd countries location, but operate out of about all the continents except few continents today. So that's the fast road. But the context of my conversation is about where do we go from here? So um, how many of you are familiar with the Industrial 4.0? Fourth Industrial Revolution, a little bit of, yeah, a little, oh, about 30%. But let me come to that. What is really coming to see, that is the possibility we saw in 2000 when the internet was coming in. The, the, you, know, you need to realize that we've been associated with the telecoms who were providing the basic infrastructure for you to deal with um, uh, the internet access. And um, so there was a phenomenal opportunity for them just to not to just provide the infrastructure, instead provide the entire space as a transaction uh, management or a, or a transaction space. Today they use their transaction management, they call it to play authentication service, only to manage the calls. That means somebody coming into the network, they know exactly, it is their own subscriber using the SIM ID. And whenever each time you make the call, whether they know whether you are allowed to make that call, whether it's domestic or international. So it's the transaction management, in other words, that authentication and authorization service. Imagine that, was, that could have been extended to authenticate even a payment transaction. Imagine that is to be available for you to even to uh, transfer money. I mean, there was a possibility of embedding that as part of the network layer itself. The understanding the underlying layer itself could have been uh, intelligent enough. So many of the countries would not, I mean, company, I mean, 
business models would not have come in, but it would have created a completely different space in terms of security and capability. We thought that that is a possibility. So we worked with some of the um, infrastructure provider at that point of time to create that. That is the, we thought that digital world, what we are seeing today, would happen there. So we prepared ourselves to provide a solution for that because completely white space. That was the first attempt. When that failed because of the dot-com bust, a lot of companies actually had initially shown a lot of interest. We even had an opportunity to work with one of the largest switch vendors at that time, which was Motorola. And uh, we worked with them as part of their uh, switching infrastructure. Um, but because of the dot-com, the whole thing, uh, I mean, fizzled away. And we used that opportunity. So today, um, interestingly, last 19 years for us was looking for the stage when the world will be ready for the digital uh, transformation. So what is digital? What is really happening is all these uh, businesses which we are conducting in, in the real world is going to get into the virtual world. Everybody agrees with that. It is not only it is going to the extent that the way in which you interact with that um, uh, world is today it is through your internet. It is very close to you through mobile now. It has come closer to you with mobile. Now it is um, um, uh, getting into with virtual reality with gestures and all that. And it can go tomorrow to your thought. That means just by thinking about it, you will be able to make some action. That means you can extend your brain or thought to the physical world seamlessly. That is the level of possibility, that is the level of technology that's already available today. It's only a question of how you harness this. Imagine such a world and the market is not just bounded because it's, not, it's unbounded market. And how do you live in such a world? How do you define the product and services for such a world? That's the kind of, that is the future of India, right? I mean, that's the opportunity which fourth industrial revolution offers. Hold on a second to that point, that thought. So we define, so what's in, let us define the character of that uh, business. Um, I want to bring in a simple example of everybody knows Uber. When Uber, imagine go back to the minds of the Uber, Imagine when they created Uber, they could have created one app just to provide a taxi calling service, which is just replacement of the, uh, the radio taxi uh, model. Or they could have given an app just to track your uh, travel with the taxi operator to, just to make sure that he is not fleecing you. And they could also provide it, um, another app to make a payment for the, uh, this thing, just like Paytm. Each three, three of them was independent value, value spaces. But what they've done instead is to combine all this and made that as one single experience. What is the fundamental need? It's the mobility is the addressed space. That means the, the space at which the function or capability which you're going to address for a particular product or service become very closer to the human need, not about keeping the functionalities for that, uh, that need. Hope I'm making it clear. So this is the kind of possibility, or this is the kind of thinking which we need to be doing for the next generation of product or services. The tomorrow's product will be addressing the very basic need of human being as the end point. I mean, no, nothing else in between. I mean, there's no value for that. It's not, there is definitely value. Imagine for Uber to be successful, they need to have excellent uh, Google map experience. They should be innovating continuously. They should have even go to the extent of the, the initial uh, tracking of their, I mean, the only value addition they have is the tracking their own um, uh, drivers, the tracking of that. That part of it should be good. And the payment interface should also be good. I mean, if you are using a credit card or anything of that sort, that infrastructure should also be good. So any of the innovation they are making is going to add the experience of this. But ultimately, you are meeting one of the human needs. Keep that example. Go to another example which you are currently working with one of the banks. So every, everybody knows that banks gives you loan for houses, right? But why do you take loan? You take loan to own a house. Why not your bank help you to get and own a house? Right from helping you to save all the way to the, that journey of uh, making a home ownership. Why then the immediate question is why should I depend on a bank? Why can't I do it? Of course you can do, but imagine the bank acts on truly on your interest. Double quotes. The possibility is phenomenal. 
So the tomorrow's world is all going to be more transparent and because there's no other choice, because people can see the, today if you want to uh, buy a, uh, go for an airline ticket, you can go and go to the comparison city, you can see who is charging you high and who is charging you low. I mean, you can get to a different prices. The transparency will come in and the, the only way you would have product and services which will exist is purely and simply because it adds more value. And that should be visible, that should be tangible, that should be uh, experienceable. It is not that everything only on the price basis, no. That will be a transition point. When you start with, there will be a, uh, uh, the co competition is on the price point. But immediately after that, it is going to be the next one. So we see the possibility of the, the, uh, the Indian, uh, no, the global market opening up for especially a kind of capability which India possesses in abundance, which is the fundamental, what you call computational skills or software skills and things like that. So there is a golden opportunity for Indian entrepreneurs to uh, get to this space and because it is going to open up a large amount of what you call uh, gaps in the field to own that and build opportunity, I mean, uh, business around it. And there are two types of models that you can adopt for this. One is that you can be good at one functional aspect and really go deep into it. We call it that vertical organizations. And there can be another type of organization which is very good in customer relationship, which is a horizontal organization, which can focus on stitching this experience to meet one customer demand. So normally that, would, that, will, that has to be larger organization. Existing brands can deal with that. Now, in this, if you go back and reflect on what India did well in the sense we definitely leverage the cost arbitrage in the last 10 to 15 years. That's why the Indian industry has grown very well, especially in software. We also uh, um, create uh, gone global with our traditional, I mean, our bricks and mortar businesses like automobile and things like that. But um, these things, what we have done in the past, definitely will not be taking us to the next level. Absolutely not. It has to be completely value-based model. It has to be completely significant value creation and your ability to collaborate. One of the biggest capabilities which you need to have is the ability to collaborate. And um, I, it's a, I don't want to go into too much of uh, the thing because it's a subject by itself. We, can, we talk about this on every day because of the uh, lack of time. I just put these few points. I, I would really welcome your questions. And uh, if you can ask very, very pointed questions, that's even better. Um, but uh, one thing which I wanted to uh, put, uh, um, uh, put across to all the people sitting here, most of the management people, is that the opportunity is phenomenal. The world is definitely available for us. And what China has done uh, for manufacturing and how they have utilized their uh, capability there and how they copied technology and innovated on top of it in a significantly higher level, that's the kind of model which we should emulate. Uh, and I would say we should even go maybe 10 times better than that. C clearly and simply looking for new value spaces, new opportunities like this, what we called as need-based product design, need-based um, or goal-based uh, services. That is the kind of product thinking or that's the kind of um, service thinking we should be looking at. Just to get to your context, why would somebody uh, getting a coffee at five rupees in the street go to a five-star hotel and pay 150 rupees? Is it for the coffee? No, it is for the coffee plus experience. So it is not always the, uh, uh, the functional cost. It is the entire stack of product plus experience is what is available to you. And it is completely up to you to how well you define your value space and uh, create your vertical or horizontal product spaces like what Uber did versus uh, maybe what Google did for Google Map. I mean, Google, of course, I'm just taking that one product. I just summarized because it's very short time, so I have 10 minutes for questions. We have a clean 10 minutes, and here is, uh, as, uh, let me first apologize for that uh, lo I mean, short of nine years. Right. That really means a lot. No, nine years is not a, a small time. Anyhow, and also, Mr. Nandumar has shown us, as our previous speaker has said, he and his team has fixed on the gaps and not on the players. And that's where Suntech is where it is today. The floor is open, and I'm sure there will be a lot of questions. We have clean 10 minutes uh, to go. 
Yes. Good afternoon, Mr. Andakumar. My Good name afternoon. is Anil. Uh, I am from TCS. Yeah. Um, I have two questions to you. Um, the first one is, as you started off your organization, um, it's, a, it's a technical company focused on technical solutions. Mm -hmm. So what was more important for you? I mean, was it the, your skill as a, as a technical person to start this off? Or your skill as an you know, entrepreneur, you know, having business plans and ideas and so on? Mm -hmm. That's the first question. Second question is, as you, as the company grew, it went from introduction to, you know, to hmm. growth and perhaps towards maturity. Um, what became more important for you? Was it still your technical hat? Was it your ideas and, you know, thoughts as an entrepreneur, as a, as a, you know, thinker? Or, or the third one, which is, you know, your role as a mentor, coach, and maybe a, you know, a harbinger of culture in your organization? Right. Two questions. Thank you. Uh, excellent questions. Um, number one, um, the first time uh, when I started, it was like um, it was a contract to build um, a billing system for Indian Telecom. It was a competitive uh, situation. Two companies were awarded the contract. That contract was not directly won by me. It was won by somebody else. And they didn't have uh, that expertise, so they subcontracted that to me. So I even took it up as a subcontract. So. To be very plain and simple, the only focus was to win that deal. So because winning, winning in the competition uh, was, uh, that was a six to one year uh, time, timeline. So the first one year, the only focus was to be completely, uh, indecisively be, uh, I mean, in, uh, in uh, what is the right word? With no ambiguity, uh, unambiguously the leader in that space. That was the only focus, to, to be very clear. So uh, definitely we won that. That is why we got the entire order in the country. So that is uh, to make it very clear. But when we started with if the, the, the idea, definitely there was a thought, I really want to win the whole of the country. That was definitely on the, uh, in, the, um, in, the, in the horizon. But the focus was completely to make that particular, the, so my technical had played a, a big role there because nothing else mattered at that point of time. But uh, this, coming back to the second point, definitely, you know, we grew, you know, this is a 29 years of history. I mean, it's not that we just happened overnight. So it was stages and those are the days where you don't get the knowledge that easily, you don't get, uh, how do you understand the domain? So it is not that I worked somewhere else and then went to the international market. I traveled for the first time to sell my product uh, internationally only to, uh, to present my product to uh, a customer in Singapore. That is how my first international travel itself happened. So it is like ability to learn from the Indian context and generalize to the international market and ability to very quickly adopt what their, what their, what their context is. So I would say the second phase was the uh, adaptability to the international market very, very quickly. I'm talking about to the extent to give you a comparison. Our first uh, customer, which we won in Europe, I mean, after this, uh, in fact, the, I got a customer in Malaysia in between. I can give, maybe use that as a reference. They were, they were, they, no new telecom customer will come and buy a product from a company unknown because they have spent billions of dollars in setting up the infrastructure and the billing system is their revenue, the, the, the system which is going to sit between their cup and lip in getting the revenue, the entire revenue, right? So if that goes wrong, the company can go belly up. So it's a, such a mission critical component for a telecom company. So that decision is a very high, I mean, CEO level decision. And it is a high value software, very high value software. It runs into millions of dollars. And uh, to get to that space with an unknown uh, brand, unknown exit, and that too from an Indian uh, this thing, it's a completely different game, right? So you can't be X person better. You have to be X times better. And then still they won't choose you because then you should say, hey, what you're sh showing is valid. So the speed at which you execute was the, the thing. So we were able to prove the capability in a matter of 45 to 60 days, complete capability, which otherwise would take about a year, year and a half. So these kind of differences, you know, bringing that kind of flexibility and adaptability was the second part of the journey. Then if you go to the other one, when you scale up, you are absolutely right. That is when the question of how do you sustain the spirit? So in a matter of from 98 to 2000, we won close to about 14 clients in Europe, and all in Europe. I mean, these are large telcos. And, uh, from just five member team, we had to grow to something like 25 member team just doing that. And even we got some, in, uh, I mean, from there we went to 100 member team in 2001. 
Now, th that's the time I priority went to what you call organization building exercise. Uh, that is a journey, I can tell you that. Building, maintaining the culture, and we went through the, because we went, we passed through this dot-com bust, and then when we went to the financial service, we went to the financial downturn. So this, this, these things keep happening, but how you stay float and redefine your strategy. Adaptability would be one of the main things. So to me, definitely, I keep this. And also, uh, we recreated spaces which nobody was competing in us. For example, in the banking space, we didn't have a competition for almost eight years. And the first time we got a competition was one of our partners itself becoming a competitor. Go there, so there, it's a, it was a bigger part now. So just to summarize the point, yeah, thank you. Any other question from the student side? Yes. Hello, so this is Girish from Insta Experiences. Mm -hmm. uh, I understand, you know, billing is a very transactional process. And just like, you know, you mentioned about experience world, I mean, the world entirely moving to the experience side. So how you map the experience of a customer to the entire individual transaction side? Brilliant question. Uh, in fact, it's very difficult. It's normally we are used to, you take a lot of time. For example, any experience is always, we always say it's a value for money, isn't it? You enjoy a coffee and then other part of the experience, how much I'm paying for it. So the financial dimension is also part of your emotional experience, isn't it? So our art is about making that better. So a glass of water here has got a certain value. Might it might have a completely different uh, value at a, in a dessert. So how do you able to, especially when the platform is flat, where you can deliver this at both the times pretty much at the same cost? It is not based on the cost which you will value. It is based on the value which you are delivering to the person. So bringing that dynamics and that science into the whole thing is our endeavor. So that's the experience part to get you there. All right. I think uh, we have two more minutes to go. So some quick questions. Yeah, yeah there it comes. Now please hold on. The mic, please, quick, quick. Please introduce yourself. Uh, I'm Vinayak Devamani. Uh -huh. I have a question. Sir, you just told about Chinese experience, hmm. the copy and hmm. uh, can you elaborate on that? Yeah, how many of you know the company called Tencent? Tencent? No, yeah, WeChat, and it's a company called, uh, they have the WeChat. So if you really look at, uh, this is a company which is actually equivalent of WhatsApp in China, uh, WeChat, that's how they started off. But um, if, you, if you really look at them, they have, uh, pretty much copied uh, um, at least half a dozen US company ideas into one single platform, including commerce. For example, they're the one who actually created what a conversational commerce. That means it's only a chatting. When you're chatting the, uh, on, on WhatsApp, imagine it was built, they had the, the payment mechanism built in the e-wallet built as part of it. Then it has got the search capability. It had uh, you know, what you call e-commerce capability. Um, it has got video calling, and you name everything what uh, a, a plethora of apps could do was all built into one single app. It is a coping, but they created an ecosystem by which they completely uh, own the customer. They don't let the customer go out of their WeChat environment. So if I just take just coping idea alone, and another brilliant thing which I come across recently is that you know um, the phone, the Oppo phone, which is uh, you know if you really look at the late I, I, iPhone uh, Max X, if you, even if you take you have got the the, uh, the screen which is the uh, the top space which is on, uh, where the um, the microphone, I mean not the microphone, the camera and uh, the earphone is fixed. Because of that, you have got a notch there, right? I mean they they come out with a brilliant idea by which even that is taken off. Now the full flat screen, so they have taken the innovation from both Samsung and Apple and innovated on top of it in, in a way that like, the moment you are trying to speak, a pop-up uh, camera, uh, camera will come up and a microphone will come up. And then you can speak the moment you uh, put it down, it automatically goes in. So I'm just trying to uh, bring in sort of small, small uh, incre incre increment, but if you really look at Apple is only adding small features as it uh, grows. But 
they were able they are able to come out with that kind of this is a very small and a trivial one but the biggest innovation they are doing in the space of artificial intelligence the amount because they have got a lot of data that is helping them big time and the amount of um, ai based products including cameras which can detect people all over the places and uh, uh, there's a lot more um, there's a huge amount of innovations happening and if you take uh, even take the case of, uh, I'll take you another comparison between Amazon, uh, not Amazon, the Uber and a uh, company called Didi, uh, which was a competition which actually bought Amazon there. Didi uh, made a point to collaborate with all the taxi drivers to start with. So whereas in, in the case of uh, Uber, taxi drivers were the biggest uh, opponent because everywhere there were the people who were against it. And they've created an ecosystem where all, all, all of them can play. So that is where the term, you know, people start coming out with, uh, the concept called the collaboration is the competition. So the more you can collaborate in your platform gives you more competitive advantage in the future. And these are all the themes which they have evolved and uh, it's a long, long story that I can talk about. If you want to discuss about it, I can talk Thank about you. it. Thank later. you, Mr. Nandumar, and we have run out of time. I know there are plenty of more questions and uh, certainly you'll be available here during the tea break. And uh, I'm sure you are, will be here, sir. Absolutely. Yeah, yeah. and uh, you can interact with him. And uh, thank you, Mr. Nandakumar. Uh, you had really kept the entire audience thank awake you. of a post heavy lunch. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you very much. I request our speaker to exit the memento. I request the moderator to press in the memento as a thank you. He explained the nuances. He went in detail, spoke about adaptability, the ability to keep learning. Thank you very much, the moderator and the speaker. And uh, Nandakumar sir, we'll shortly see you again on stage. So please do make yourselves comfortable. We just need a few seconds for the stage to be set. Meanwhile, uh, let me remind you, we have the ball that is right there. It's got all the names that will move around for the lucky draw. So if you've not registered yet, if you've not dropped your name yet, kindly do it. And we reiterate that the lucky winner has to be present when, luck's no when luck knocks at your door, you should ensure that you open the door, you should be there. So that is the only condition that you have placed. Oman Travels is offering a Europe trip. So do not miss the trip. Do stay back uh, till the valedictory session to know who the lucky winner is. And uh, the stage is almost getting ready. The next session is going to be a panel discussion. And the panel discussion will be on the sub-theme Indian startup to global standup. Young Indian businessmen and technocrats are slowly coming of age from Indian startup to a global level standups before scaling to reach up unicorn levels. Stories of Mintra, of uh, Mar Labs, of Swiggy, etc. testify this. So let us hear from the promoters of these enterprises the challenges that they are facing, the prospects that they see to be the unicorns. So I would like to request the moderator to accompany the speakers on stage. Uh, the moderator needs uh, uh, a special applause. I would call him the Sutradhar of this event. May I request Mr. S.R. Nair to please accompany our speakers for the session. Mr. Sujit Sudhagaran, Mr. Rinish Kain, Mr. K. Nandakumar again on stage, Mr. Sibi Vadakekara, Mr. S.R. Nair. A professional turned entrepreneur with 33 years of experience in information technology. For six years, he was on the board of Kerala Venture Capital Fund, which was founded by the government of Kerala. We are cutting it off. Everybody knows, so he doesn't want to be uh, want it to be repeated. So welcome, sir. And I request our moderator to uh, present bouquets to our panelists. Mr. Sujit Sudhagaran, the senior director of the brand marketing of Mintra. Mintra is a household name today. He started his career in telecom sales and then moved on to advertising and marketing. And we have Mr. Rinish Kayan, the Chief Technology Officer of Rapid Value. Our tech guru for the day is Mr. Rinish Kayan. He keeps track of the next generation technologies, 18 years of experience in the field. That is Mr. Rinish Kayan. Mr. K. Nandakumar, he just spoke to us. He is also part of this panel. And we also have with us Mr. C.B. Anthony Vadakekara, the founder and chairman of uh, Mar Labs Group USA and India. Uh, uh, and under the suggestion of the moderator, I have kept the introduction brief. 
Now I'm going to hand over the platform to the moderator and the panelists. Good afternoon. Okay. <coughs> yeah. Um, uh, Mr. Nandagumar has taken us through a session which normally supposedly a, could have been a sleepy session, but you kept us awake with your uh, with with a lots of uh, uh, technology related but strategic inputs on how you have taken the organization around. And nice of you that you kept your past with you so that I could ask you some questions. Otherwise, you know that uh, would not have been there. Okay. And we have. Uh, Another gentleman, uh, see, I'm so proud of sitting along with all of these people. Two of them had been bestowed the KMS prestigious technology leadership award in the past. One, last year it was Sibi Vadakekara, and the year before that it was Nanda Kumar. A round of applause to them again. And, okay, so we have Ranish from Rapid Value sitting on the far end of me, and we have Mintra. How many of you have shopped in Mintra in this? There are, there are hands, there are hands. So, oh, you are not that, you know, everybody knows you, but not you. It is still but the company, the company, right. That's very good. Nanda Kumar, you have known, and uh, Mr. Sibi Vadakekara, he is in the States now, Mar Labs. He also has uh, its own India Development Center here. The idea of this session is to explore and understand the, 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 from these leaders who had built up their organization. You heard, you know, Nandakuma saying that, okay, the first set of software, the complete set of software for the billing, for the tour package, which we called it then, all by himself. There wasn't any other person as a part of the coding team. From, so, from system analysis, okay, gap finding, and then flow chart, algorithm, typical coding, everything, and the execution also was done by him. I, 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 my, my, my association with him actually goes back to his Keltron days, actually, you know, where he was working in Keltron at that time. Okay. So now you have heard as to single-handedly how, uh, how an organization has been built up, but now it has become a very credible organization. We know about last time, you know, the award time, we had uh, really uh, 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 described the, the, the challenges as well as the achievements that uh, CB Vadakekara had undergone to set, undergone to set this uh, uh, organization up. He couldn't come to receive the award himself, so he sent his elder brother, who was the chairman and managing director of South Indian Bank, Mr. V. A. Joseph, to come. He came and received the award on, on his behalf. And we have heard of Mintra, who had by itself undergone transformations of an e-commerce company, then withdrawing from the web space and going to the mobile space, coming back to the website. So we'll hear about that. You know, the, what are the transformations that they have undergone to come to this level? We have, of course, Renish, who actually is a very successful story at our, our info park, whereas Nandagumar is techno park and beyond. Our Renish is info park and here. Okay, so how he has built up an organization called Rapid Value, got funded, and then moving forward to see. So what is the scene? The scene is, I just look at this entrepreneurship into three stages. One stage is called startup. We have at Kerala Startup Mission close to about 1,500 startups are registered. I have been very closely associated with all of them, most of them, as well as the startups of KSIDC and others who are even not registered with, this, with these institutions. Okay. Startup is, you know, as they said, the passion, you know, the, 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 the origin you to do something and prove your ability and, 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 that, and, and the one. And then all of us realize that when you start up, all the startup does not go into the stand-up space. Many of them wither away. Okay? They go back to the drawing board or they go, they go back to the employment. We have seen many of them actually uh, going away like that. And then they come to a stage of stand-up. Okay? They're able to breathe. They're able to breathe. They're able to be there. Okay? And that they would have achieved by the level of funding that must have happened, um, angels or series A and things like that. And that would have sustained to come to a stand-up stage. And it is at this stage, they, they look at the product is completely ready. They have set of customers, revenues are coming, profitability is actually established. And thereafter, the third phase happened, that's called scaled up phase. Mr. Nandakumar actually had told you how to sustain. So we were actually asking him at that point in time, he was, he was telling you how he's actually, he's between stand up to scale up and, and go, go beyond that. 
so these stages start up stage and the stand up stage and the scale up stage these are the three stages of uh, this entrepreneurship okay so we have with us i have we have we have chosen those organization who are now come to the stand up stage and then looking at the scale up stage and that's where they are so i'm going to ask them some questions in the past and i'm going to ask them some the, the challenges that they faced and then i'm going to ask them as to what are the scaling possibilities that they see for see in front of them and probably as a strategy if they can tell you if they don't want to tell you they'll tell you as to what they're going to look up at okay because you know the he some strategies cannot be revealed you know because that becomes an ip and that is what they they go up at okay so that's where yeah. so let me start with uh, yeah i will give you a little rest nand kumar because you know you you really deserve it yeah i'll take you to let next level so i'll start with you mr b you have the mic with you okay now the question is mar labs and incidentally please you know i i think he need another round of applause he's travel thousands of kilometers to be with us he came back today by about 10 o'clock from the new york from from new jersey was it this new jersey he he flew down from new jersey to be with us today and and we are, we are so glad that chose your not only your commitment and and to talk to the people who some of you can actually emulate you in in times to come okay sir when you started mar labs okay did you ever think that this is going to be a proposition like the, that you see now okay and and what how, how what what is that which actually took you to that that startup of the mar labs okay will you be able to give them some idea absolutely uh, i uh, never thought uh, the journey that we took all these years uh, at the time when you start a business uh, especially as an immigrant uh, your aspirations are short term you don't yes. you don't really look long term uh, but interestingly there are certain fundamentals to business and if you think through that and and plan ahead Uh, there are ups and downs in business always yes and there are economic cycles technology cycles uh, all those things you can't predict when you when you start you know. and not in your control too yeah yeah over a period of time you develop instincts you develop judgment at least you minim- you could minimize the risk so uh, absolutely no 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 idea that we would grow to the scale and uh, there were no business plan when i started i see <laughs> so yours is a business we establishment started without a business plan yes. so i'll say you evolved absolutely absolutely yeah. every business need to transform every few years and in our industry tech you need to even evolve faster yes uh, rate of change is so fast unless you accelerate and you know meet with the changing demands of the marketplace it's it's very hard to sustain yeah. right so but what was the thought at that point in time when you started it and you had this and everybody has his passion ambition etc but did you know at that time that okay i'm really going to be at it and going to take it forward and or you said okay inshallah well, i think it was uh, i come a little bit from a business family my father and grandfather started a bank and But, okay uh, they, it got nationalized during indira gandhi's regime and things like that so as a young kid as a teenager i knew what a debt to equity ratio was very good how interest rate i fluctuated. don't even know that now sir actually so after so many years uh, i was reading readers digest i went to for my undergrad degree in trivandrum okay. engineering so i was reading in those days not anymore uh, there are enough uh, examples here those days it was read that us used to be the best place for entrepreneurship okay so that inspired me to go there for my grad studies for my post graduate studies yeah. and uh, I happened to work in Silicon Valley. All right. So I worked for a large firm then I worked for a couple of startups. Okay. And that's where I learned the tricks of the trade and the details and the nuances of this business and obviously one of the startups I worked uh they fired all the American managers. Okay. So I was a slave labor who would do <laughs> everything but the experience was tremendous. I could understand how venture capital worked, how value added reselling system worked and uh it was tremendous amount of experience uh, the founders were extremely wealthy okay they had their own private jets and ferraris and girlfriends so and girlfriends were, yeah they were partying half the time yes i was doing the, all the hard work <laughs> but their experience i don't I, i i really thank them for that but experience really helped me uh, and gave the confidence to start this venture i have another question that is evolved out of the answer that you had given me see the startup of your time at silicon yeah. valley then yeah. and the startup of these times that yeah. we see now 
Do you see any difference? Oh, huge, huge, absolutely different. I believe this is, you know, probably in the history of the whole universe, this is the best time to start a tech business. Okay. Those days, you need huge servers. You need a lot of capital to start a tech company in the valley. Right. Uh, you know, today you can use Google Cloud, Google App Engine. Consumable APIs are there. It's right. called an API economy now. So whatever idea you have, you can consume from different partners or products. And if your idea is compelling, you almost have a minimal viable product before you raise capital. Absolutely. Yeah. A new term that I learned today, API economy. Great, actually. There's a new term, API economy. Great. Okay. So uh, those days, it was hugely challenging to raise capital. Right. Uh, there are certain ne network there. Uh, some networks are Jewish networks. Right. Unless you have access to that system, you, you can't raise capital. Uh, others are connects through you know one of the Ivy League schools, Harvard or Stanford. That's a network. Uh, your professor calls and says, this kid is good. He's starting something. But today, you don't need any of this. Capital is flowing wherever the best ideas are. Capital is flowing to wherever the talent is. Uh, you would be amazed uh, if you look at SoftBank. A lot of capital is coming from Saudi Arabia. Absolutely, yes. And that capital is flowing into markets like Valley or New York or Boston. Uh, and, and those companies are run by uh, a lot of conflicting interests. Anyway, I want to go there. But what I'm saying is that you know, today it's truly a global economy. Things are much different. If you're creative, if you're innovative, you, you have the passion, the drive, the hunger. You can do it from Cochin, what you could, what you could do 20 years from Valley. So yeah. it's, a, it's a different world altogether. Absolutely. One great point, and I think it's a very motivating point for lots of people here in the capacity as startups as well as students. He said, capital flows to where the talent is. Capital flows to where the talent is, and that surmises everything. So you don't have to worry about money, which in his times there had been, that has not been the case actually. So I'll 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 come back to you, sir. Now before you come to Renish, okay, because I told Nandakuma that I'll go to him last. I'm, I'm giving him some rest. Uh, I would like to hear the Mintra story, okay? So, so will you be able to give us the the, the, the audience some gyan about what was the beginning of Mintra and the evolution of Mintra and the challenges that you underwent? So, um, Mintra, we actually started off as a very small venture, which was actually selling you customized T-shirts. So you would come and tell me that customized T-shirts, T-shirts, okay. that's all, and uh, coffee mugs, and that's basically what we used to do at the start of it, right? Um, about two, three years into doing that business, what the the then bunch of guys who used to run it realized that this is never going to scale. So the whole point you mentioned about scale up is never going to happen. Yes, and um, I think uh, it was just a bunch of guys sitting together and thinking, what do I get into, right? Also, All right. I think a large part of entrepreneurship is also about uh, having a certain amount of gut. You know, I mean, it's not everything is number driven, not everything. This is, this is a sense. I mean, uh, people ask, do you, are you born with a sense, etc. I think you develop it when you, once you, uh, as Sibin said, you know, when you dirty your hands, you get that sense is my, the way of looking at it, right? Uh, they decided to sell uh, sports shoes. Uh, sports shoes was available. Uh, only in stores at that point of time. They actually went and bought it from Adidas stores, Nike stores, and they said, we are listing it on our site. Okay. So that's the next stage of scaling that happened for Mintra. Uh, that is the early part of the phase of Mintra, and I think the uh, so-called stand-up phase, as he was saying, uh, came from Mintra when probably uh, both Mintra and Flipkart was actually funded by Tiger Group, which was the, they were the largest funders for the group, and they decided to bring the two entities together because the... Uh, investors saw synergies in the two large e-commerce setups coming together. Uh, also, the big difference between Mintra and uh, we call ourselves a vertical because we work only on fashion. Uh, our average selling price point is significantly higher than what you will happen on a Flipkart because Flipkart sells across multiple platforms. Right, so the yes. average value comes down. I think the um, stand-up and scale-up phase of Mintra is actually, um, you know, it's actually a boldness story to my mind, right? You know. As a startup, they could have focused on a aspect of business and then say, okay, let me get good at this. They opened up all friends. So Mintra was one of the first companies to set up an in-house lab. In-house lab. Lab to create technology in-house. 
Uh, we so you wrote your own software, is that so? Yes. Okay. Right. Uh, we created an in-house logistics division okay. where we could have actually gone to eCart, which was larger and owned by Flipkart. We decided no because we wanted a differentiated supply experience to be created. But which meant ha setting hasn't up that been a very costly endeavor, you know, recreating the entire but logistics? But my sense is it paid off, right? Okay. I mean, the way to look at it is, see, the, 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 the guys could have decided not to take the risky route of opening up multiple friends. Yeah. And they were definitely questioned by the promoters at that point of time, are you really opening up too many friends? Can you really run it? Right. But they demonstrated they can run it, right? Okay. I mean, the, the fact that... So it clicked. It clicked. See, the fact is, uh, you should open up multiple friends is what I would say. Uh, but you need to have a little thought out plan behind it. They were not only driven by gut. They had a... Uh, so, uh, you know, the, the, the original, the, none of them today are part of our system. Uh, they're actually a very interesting mix, actually. That's also a good, uh, interesting part of how startups do well. You had very bold, ambitious people who would just go ahead and say, we have to just do it. All right. I would just not bother how it can be really done. But you need such people in your system because somebody need to have that big, bold, hairy, That momentum creator. And he he's that kind of guy. Then yeah. there were the extremely calm, composed people who said, okay, uh, you want to do this, uh, we may not get there in day one, we'll probably get there in day 10, so let's go ahead and do it. Then there were hardcore, uh, feet on ground kind of characters who will sit down and say, okay, now let me break down this into multiple elements and do that. So, uh, actually Mintra, in a way, is what we learn a lot in our management textbooks over a period of time, uh, but done in a more intuitive fashion. And um, I think fundamental reason because we scaled up was that four years of deciding to open up multiple friends and saying that I will stand on my feet as an individual business, not necessarily as a part of the larger group. Mm. So that, that possibly is what got us today. And today probably we are getting into the scale-up phase at this point in time of saying that, okay, what percentage of fashion sale can we get? So four years back we used to talk about what percentage of online fashion sale can we get? So that's the change in ambition. So you're moving from fashion to to online to fashion sales, actually. Yeah, because um, uh, I, I could very well be happy taking a greater share of online fashion, but that is not going to sustain me over a longer period of time, right? I need to go after and see that why do people don't buy fashion online? Can I get them on my... How old is Mintra and now? We are about 11 years old. 11 right? years. From the time we were starting to sell coffee mugs. So <laughs> counting yeah, from, from that time on. Yeah, okay. Now, w what was the thought behind it? Because you said, you know, you the, it's a bunch of people... The, the aggressive type of personalities, the common composed type of personalities, and those freakouts in between, they said they, they will swing both sides, actually. Now, but at the same time, if you uh, uh, look at, uh, there were some strategic decisions that you have taken related to Mindra going through the, through the mobile only. And then you were, you were forced to take it back and then... Uh, no. Will you, uh, you didn't. So uh, Can you the, tell them the story? That's not the story. Yeah. The, uh, story is, yes, we decided to go app only. That was definitely a call that we had taken. And there was enough data to support the fact that uh, India will be a larger mobile or accessing internet through mobile kind of an economy, which we are already... Today, we're close to 75% of internet access in India is through a mobile device and it's not through a desktop device, right? Uh, let's accept that for all e-commerce players today, close to 70% of the business comes from the app. Very good, okay. Right. Uh, it'll be a little lesser for the horizontals, which is primarily your Flipkarts and Amazons. That's also probably because their presence in tier two, tier three markets are much larger than ours. Yes. Their still mobile access is not to the level probably you would see in a tier one, tier two city. Uh, we went in app only. Uh, it didn't really significantly hit our business. To be very honest, in the early phase, it did not take away from our business per se. But uh, we started seeing a sign about the number of acquisitions that we were getting from uh, tier two, tier three started going down. That's when we realized that probably desktop access of those markets hadn't come back. I really don't think it is a rollback. You, see, you know, m my sense about business is, see, I have worked a l large part of my life in traditional companies. For me also, Mintra has been a great learning, right? Uh, in the startup e-com world, you are very bold about taking your decisions. You're really, you don't see rolling back a decision as a mistake. That was an experiment that I did. No, absolutely. No, we are not saying that right? it's a mistake. I, I think said that we roll back. Uh, we have a desktop site, uh, but desktop still is not the main play for us and it will not be. And as technology progresses, this is the device where you will do everything from today. Absolutely. Today you don't need to move around without anything else. You can actually, I mean, I remember about a decade back, there was a BlackBerry phone ad which said that this gentleman going on his business tour carrying only his BlackBerry. Blackberry. Uh, it was not uh, a reality at that point. Today is definitely a reality. So from that perspective, 
uh, one other thing which you would see a uh, mintra do a lot or m likes of us do a lot is experimentation so there is not necessarily a proof of concept required before we do an experiment we don't really wait to do a pilot get a proof of concept and then roll it out because yeah, that's something that i'd like you to talk to because see uh, one is i am just trying to refer the art and the science of the business the art is the gut the intuition etc that you have the science is the data that actually gives you and consolidates your th th thoughts okay so uh, people generally you know try to combine both but now we are into data analytics so they say data says everything data gives you insight and data gives you that from all through that what you have been telling you have been telling about this intuition and the gut okay so that so i surmise that there is a level of art side of the, the art factor of the decision making in mintra which is something that many people are not really aware of will you be able to throw some light on that so um, see uh, we have i think probably an e-commerce company has the maximum amount of data the most richest data right so every footprint that you leave in my app or on my desktop i know so at what how many seconds you spend on a particular product and how much did you scroll did you see all the information on that page i know every piece of that information right now all that information tells me that what you did now what i really don't know unless otherwise you go into a slightly more traditional way of understanding the consumer is why did he do that correct the why question is where the art comes in correct uh, unfortunately data has not reached or or data related or collecting data has not re re reached a stage wherein i can really use data methods to get the why out of it for the why part of the question we still go back to uh experience uh we go back to popular culture and especially in fashion popular culture is a great sign of what is probably going to happen so those things that we used to do maybe in a slightly ad hoc fashion in the past today i can do a lot of that see social listening is a big thing and uh, data really allows me to do that right the word clouds which did not exit ex exist a decade back in marketing uh, you know rooms today is a very important thing what is that consumer is talking about without asking the consumer the the the, the, the traditional research method to say you go ask something and you get an answer today i don't need to ask from that perspective so uh, that's where the art part of it comes and in our world it is more driven by trends uh, just to answer that other point you mentioned, uh, is data the be all of end all of it? No, data is not. But data makes decision making much more precise. Precise and the, the chances maybe easier. Of, yeah, easier, the, the, the yeah. chances of failure are lower, which is why we said we go ahead and do a lot of pilots without necessarily waiting for a proof of concept. We can just go ahead and do it because you know that uh, a large part of the possible doubts are already cleared because data is available to tell you. Right. That. I'll come back to Sujit. So let me go to Renish because. Uh, Though lots of us in coaching are aware of your organization, uh, compared to Mar Labs or Suntech or even Mintra, Mintra is a brand, so therefore they have spent a lot of money on build that brand on a B2C space. But uh, your organization, Rapid Value, is to that extent not known. So we would definitely like to know your story of the buildup of Rapid Value and uh, and and the funding, etc. That is that is propelled you to the next stage. Will you be able to give us some input on that, please? Yeah, sure. So before I answer your questions, I would, I'm very happy to be here along with Nandoma, sir. <laughs> so um, he gave my first salary. Thank you, sir. Wow, that's yeah. great. <laughs> so there's a mentor and a mentee here, actually. OK, very yeah. nice. Okay. So I, I joined Santa on a 15th, uh, November 15th, 2000. OK. So, um, so I got the salary with his signature on it because that day wow. <laughs> you cannot uh, credit to bank because it's only 15 days. So did you keep the check or did you bank it? And at that time itself. You I should have kept <laughs> it. Now the value of that would have gone to much mul multiple ways. <laughs> yeah, so yes. I'll tell you a, a small incident on this. One of the entrepreneurial ED here, I took it to IAMK for doing a lecture. So I was teaching entrepreneurship there. So for our, they pay about 4,000 bucks as, as, as a fee. So it was 8,000 rupees in her name, I am signed. She's yet to bank it, it is four years now. She has actually framed it and kept it in her robe, actually. Say that, look, I went and taught at the IAMK. You would have kept something like that, actually. He was waiting for the salary to come. <laughs> <laughs> okay, go ahead with your story, yes. Okay, so we started uh, Rapid Value with the other two co-founders in 2009. And um, we are we are into services space, and so that time you know you know that the mobile was the the biggest thing, and then we started with uh, mobile services, mobile app. You know there were a lot of companies who started during that time, so we were providing services on mobile, and we also were in the in, in one among that. And uh, so if you ask me why we started, no answer. No okay, answer. No answer. Everybody says passion, commission, yeah, yeah, purpose, sense of all this. You know we we uh, we thought about 
uh, we start no, you we, could we, have stayed back and worked you know so but there was something that pushed you into this yeah definitely so uh, if we you know as a person so like uh, you know the intro so i am a techie person so uh, you know so we started or there are a couple of things which i learned from suntech one is that you know you hard work and second is like you know fearlessly you deal with the technology yes. okay so the year i joined suntech that's the time you know we introduced java uh, yes. so where uh, nadomo so written and everything was in oracle and uh, so we converted that in java and that responsibility was part of our team and then we were like you know juniors and then uh, you know he could have think that okay let me get a, another 10 year guy who d does java but instead of that he gave that opportunity to all of us and then that's the same thing for us as a challenge you know a rapid valley if you look at it, we are a young company always the average age of uh, our employees are less than 26 and uh, so we give them opportunity to learn and um, how many are there now Rinesh? we are about uh, 500 people right 500 now. people yeah so, so we it is in how many years uh, 10 years 10 years okay go ahead yeah so uh, you know so that's where we started with the mobile development company and uh, then from there you know uh, so we know that uh, the scalability right so any startup you know, it will get stuck in 70s 70 employees or 100 we are into services so for us the growth means the number of uh, headcounts okay so uh, so when we get onto the mobile we know that okay so mobile is good but at the same time in you know, a mobile won't uh, give you a a sustained business from a mobile application developer perspective. So we get on to uh, the cloud, big data, analytics, uh, and over a period of time, so we set up different services uh, for our growth. And so now you know, we are more focusing on cloud technology. And uh, so what is that, you know, the, the, the real strength behind our growth was not technology. So te te technology definitely the one thing. So we always, uh, you know, work on the solutions. Okay, we work with the world's largest um, uh, social networking platform, and uh, we work with the uh, the, the world's. Which you're saying that you didn't want to name it, so yeah. Yeah, I'm definitely. The same name, right? Yeah. Okay. Sorry. And uh, and we work with um, uh, his competitor as well in India. Okay. Okay. So everywhere, you know, we we won't say that you know I'll come and do iOS development or I'll come and do cloud enabling or you know, I will get you to AWS or whatever, right? So we'll we'll go to our strategy is more like you know so we get on to the the consulting engagement first and we understand what the customer needs as opposed to we'll tell them that okay this is what. But you did need. the customer pay you for the consulting that you do? Uh, many times no. No, that's what I'm saying. Yeah, many times no, so but there's you know, a risk of investing. You no, know, but the investment will not be like you know not for a longer period. Okay. So we'll do it for a week, yeah. or that considers our sales expense. Right. Uh, and uh, so many times you know we go. With, I mean, so we have uh, offices across the. Uh, EU, I mean, so our predominant market is US and Europe and oh. UK. Right. So in Europe also certain Germany is uh, one of our focus area. And uh, in UK, specifically, we don't work with uh, other parts of UK. We'll work specifically in London. Okay. So in the US also, we work in specific areas like, you know, East Coast and West Coast. In West Coast, we work in California. So that we have people over there anyways. Okay, the, our sales and uh, the account management people are there. So they go to their place. Uh, so that way, you know, we are not incurring other expenses to do this consulting engagement. Okay. And some of the things, you know, we all off offshore it. So only that front ending will happen there and offshore it uh, and get it done from uh, Kochi or Bangalore office. Your, your development center is predominantly in India only, right? So yeah, we do have uh, in Kochi, in Four Park, and then Bangalore, and we have a small development center in Los Angeles. Okay. So it's about maybe 10, 15 people working there right. uh, on the near shore. Okay. Let me come to the, the, your, your mentor then, therefore. Yeah. Okay. So we have given you sufficient rest, sir. Uh, you just started that 20 minutes of your presentation by saying that you wrote everything, started like, you know, it was... It was from very, very humble beginnings that you had started, you know. You, while even working in Kale Road, you wrote some program, then you came out and all this had been done. So what were the challenges that you had faced at that point in time and how did it all come around? Did you really know that now the Sendak of today, that did you perceive it to be there when you all started? We all know that you're a hard worker. We all know that you're, a, you're, you're very strong. You're, your intellectual power is very high as far as algorithm and coding is concerned. All of us know. But did you at that point in time know that this is going to be the case? Um, yeah. See, uh, what got fascinated me at that time was the stories of Microsoft and Oracle. Oh, lovely. Okay. Right. I mean, I was working in a public sector with uh, guaranteed retirement. Yes. And very young, st just started. 
and uh, you know in those days Keltron was the dream job we Absolutely, changed Absolutely, yes. Any, anyone can attempt and within Keltron I was in the R&D unit. Yes. So, which is the dreamest place which you can ever think of. In, in Kerala. Ke in Kerala. Yes. So, uh, leaving that job was a big decision. Absolutely. Right? It is not that easy to do it and especially just after my marriage. <laughs> <laughs> okay. That was even more challenging. And uh, so, you needed uh, uh, at least convince socially and uh, family wise that I'm not doing a stupid thing. <laughs> right? So that was a big, uh, to be being, that was the only biggest challenge. Fortunately, Kerala government helped me on that front. They introduced what is known as the Entrepreneur Development Scheme on those days, right. where they gave us five years sabbatical. Absolutely, that came great. So right. you have not left the job per I se, no? Per se. <laughs> and they are, I mean, as long as I, because that's the time Techno Park was. There was, a, there was, was also a possibility of going back, actually. Yes. Techno Park was fine. Right, okay. Then definitely I was obsessed with the fact that I will only do a product company. Reason being, uh, the, if it is successful, the value creation is exponential. Absolutely. Right? So then uh, the question is if anyone else can do uh, a software, why don't you try it out? I mean, uh, so that was the kind of, and I old, the, my experience in Keltron also gave uh, a lot of confidence. Right. Because the kind of things which we solved on those days were unimaginable. I mean, even today I don't face that kind of challenges, to be very frank. So maybe that, uh, I mean, that is, you know, uh, Professor was talking. Incidentally, there was another thing. You're, you're a, you're a postgraduate in physics. Right. You're not an engineer. No. You also were not, were you trained on computer programming and things like that at no, point? No, all my So what was that, uh, what was that thing that actually that pushed you to it actually? No, that is very accidental. What okay. happened was, after my MBA, I, heart of heart, I am still a physicist. Okay. I enjoy physics. Okay. I, I mean, that's my passion. I like to learn uh, the nature and the how it is constructed. That is my uh, thing. But um, then, of course, I was in my dream. I wanted to be an entrepreneur. Okay. That was that was also decided for some reason. Right. I don't know why, but that was. So it yeah. went into your DNA. It was there in my in a subconscious mind. Even even when we were, even when I was in Keltron, I knew I, I wanted to do something. Yeah, else. I could see that you knew even at that time. That's yes. Right, yes. Yeah. Right. So that was very clear. So um, then uh, the question is, you know, you know, it's a big ticket decision. So uh, the reason why I came to, I, I was after my MBA, I mean MSc, I was planning to go for MBA in IM. Okay. So where did I go? For a brilliant tutorial for t CAT training <laughs> <laughs> okay. in Chennai. Yes. So uh, mornings were, and the evenings were those training, but in the morning I was uh, completely wasting my time. So I saw a board called NIIT. Okay. So I just went there for a programming course. Wow, yeah. That's all what I did. Kodumakam, was it somewhere in Kodumakam? That, that was in uh, um, uh, College Road. Okay, College Road, okay. Near yeah. Nagambakam. Yes. So that's where. So uh, that I just did for, uh, just for time pass, to be very frank, but I really got addicted to that. And immediately I got placed in HCL after yeah. that. So I actually started with HCL for about uh, a year. Yeah. And then moved Came to Kelton. Yeah. Yeah. So that is, so the point is, um, Definitely, yeah, that was the, there was a uh, motivation uh, and uh, the product business. Uh, it was, I would rather call it very intrinsic in you, in, in, among this, you know, which you're the only one who came and said that I wanted to be an entrepreneur, which is a very intrinsic thing that already right. sort of, what you hardwired, it's like an, into an ASIC, the embedding has yeah, happened. That, like. that was the, the, first, the possibility fascinated me, you know, right. the, the story, if you really look at, just doing sitting, so that's what I did. I mean, sitting right in Trivandra or in a uh, room in uh, Tuchur DOT office. You could do something which has got a phenomenal value creation. Absolutely. Right? Ex exponential. So exponential value creation. So that possibility, I mean, in those days, having that possibility itself is a, is a phenomenal access to that. No, I think, you know, those days we used to actually look at you very jealous with a lot of jealousy, a lot of envy. Right. This guy got this software development order. That's what we used to say. Right. I was at that time working in I, didn't, I, I didn't get that order. I, somebody else got it. Yeah, somebody that. else got they, But they, it was earmarked. We knew that, actually. No, no. no. They didn't know. Uh. They didn't have the, They actually went to the computer, uh, computer science department. Okay. They were doing it first. And yeah. when got delayed, only I got I yep, You came into the picture. Okay. So, uh, challenges per se during that time? You no, know, like mm, uh, but taking a sabbatical leave and then... Uh, no, I, I think I should be... Uh, I must say that I've been a little fortunate because of this situation. I didn't have to have a, ca a seed capital. Okay. I asked the company, who actually, which is Transmatic. Yes. Asked them to give me an advance, to, and also a computer to work on. So right. I didn't have to invest on capital. Yes. All I did was to just program. 
Yeah, that's right. So that once the program was successful, we got uh, about five repeat orders, which was on those days close to about 10 lakhs of rupees. Uh, big money at that big time. Money, yes. Big money on those days. And which went into multiple You know, uh, close to about, we installed close to about 250 installations in the country. That's right. It was a great thing, actually. Uh, Sibi, so coming back to you, uh, see, the, the difference between what you did and what they did, you went to the States for study. Okay. So you were in a completely different ecosystem as compared to Nandakumar or even Pranesh or Mintra, because they were homegrown here. So, no, there's a difference to that, you know. So, wh how do you see this difference yourself, you know? What, were you fortunate or you, you sometimes, you know, in the beginning you said you did all the horses work and they, they, they were partying and you were the IT coolie working for them, you know, that sort of a thing. But then, so, uh, uh, how is the, what is the, the, from the stories that we heard, how different is your story in the, in the initial time? I think there are a lot of commonalities from what, oh. listening to all of them. But Great. I think, uh, irrespective of where you are, there are, you know, certain layers of common themes for entrepreneurship. Uh, obviously, a little bit of luck and timing plays, but, you know, most of the ambition or inspiration, all those things comes together, yeah. even if you are in different parts of the world. So, I believe there is a lot of commonalities from what I could infer from all, all, all three of the fellow panelists today. Yeah. So, I mean, so that is, therefore, these commonalities exist in this in the process of entrepreneurship. That's what you're trying to say, absolutely, right? Absolutely. So that is a learning for them. You know, yeah. these commonalities of uh, that we have been from the morning onwards listening to it. You know, the passion, the commitment, the work, etc. So, but then, as an ecosystem, how different was this? I think U.S. in general is brutally competitive, especially those days. Mm -hmm. 90s was very competitive. It has, uh, you know, it has become a little more easier now. Uh, those days, it was very demanding. And, uh, uh, you know, any business model that you pick, you have to be very careful because a lot of business models that are very exciting, fascinating, the underlying model is itself is like winner takes all. Winner you, takes all. One or two companies were going to succeed and hundreds of them struggle maybe five, several years and, and, and fail. Uh, so... It's, it's great for entrepreneurs. Uh, I don't believe it is as great as it used to be in the good old days when right. I went there. Probably uh, India, China. Uh, I believe uh, in China, the number of AI machine learning companies, startups that are coming is unbelievable. The quality of talent, the rigor of execution. Same thing is slowly happening in Eastern Europe. Okay. Uh, because the engineers are bright, they are faster. So in the digital world, today's world, more than anything, speed is important. Uh, but I believe India and in general, Kerala got a tremendous advantage because of the demographic uh, situation in India. Uh, if you look at, uh, most of the futurists predict that China would overtake US yeah. in like 30, 40 years or so, approximately some point of time. Similar point of time, futurists predict that uh, singularity, the point where right. artificial Merging. intelligence yes. exceed human intelligence, right. these two are converging there. But if you look at the demographic, Chinese people are also going to be you know, aging at that point of time. That's right. So India got a tremendous advantage to catch up in the delta, maybe in the 10 year time frame or so, because of the demographic advantage and, and the talent and uh, all the young people uh, motivated and working hard, and also access to internet and content, like uh, today HBX, which is the Harvard online program, is accessed all over the world. So Absolutely. a Absolutely. kid sitting here can study about artificial intelligence as much as somebody in Boston. So those kind of opportunities are opening up. Right. Now, uh, coming to, uh, I'm just trying to put some, some level of uh, about the future. So how do you look at the future now? Marlabs with uh, your India Development Center, you have centers across the world and having headquartered out of uh, uh, US. So what's your, what's your scale up model? How do you, I mean, like we have, we see today we have TCS, which is about 4.2 lakhs, that's about 4.2 lakhs people. So what's the level of growth that you envisage for you and how do you want to go about with this? Yeah, we have been growing at around 10% uh, per year on annum, year. year on year, but uh, we believe the future of our industry is going to be non-linear. Uh, because okay. you have to build components or accelerators, as I told you before, API economy. So that's what we are betting on, betting on an IP ecosystem and a partner ecosystem that could leverage our 
capability. Would you be wanting to go up to getting it listed in NASDAQ? We, we, we thought about it, but uh, uh, running a publicly traded company in the U.S. is uh, probably uh, worse than traveling in a transport bus in Kerala. <laughs> <laughs> that is it's, it's that the, difficult. The, the complaints, <laughs> the currency fluctuations, all the global issues. Uh, so it's, uh, you know... You know, companies can go IPO there. It's not a big deal. But you know, what do you do after that? The street expectation. So you're not looking at that scenario. Right, not right away. Maybe if we hit somewhere around 300 million or so in terms of revenue, maybe we we'll look at that. Not right now. But what we are looking at the interesting opportunities, not just for us, for anybody here. Yeah. Is that we believe quantum computing is real. Absolutely. And the next few years, that opportunity is huge. And. Once quantum versus classical, once quantum becomes mainstream, uh, all the security, whatever software, security protocols and tools that have now will get, you know, will be will obsolete. Yes. So we believe self-governing systems like blockchain will mature. Right. And blockchain will counter that challenge of security issue because 50 percent of the nodes in the blockchain needs to be hacked in order to hack the system. It's a self-governing, self, self yes. So those intersection of those two in the next four or five years is very exciting for us. Oh, so we are doing something both on the security space as well as uh, working with blockchain for pharma companies to, to track any drug that comes to market, yep. where it originated, what the compounds were, where they procured it. So that improves quality of life. That improves uh, that you know. That's going to be a very exciting world in in five in to the ten next years. Five years time. Five to ten years time. Uh, we don't know the inflection point, but that's what we are hugely betting on, especially in the healthcare life sciences space. Uh, Ladies and gentlemen, so that is for the host's mouth. Quantum computing, blockchain. I mean, that's where you need to concentrate in the next five to ten years time. Yes, sir. You were saying something. Especially a country like India, right? A lot of efficiencies can be brought in when these two converge. Transportation systems, ID, security, airports. Enormous amount of use cases. Uh, right. Hundreds of business cases, even in a place like Kerala, where farming and agriculture is important. All right. Yeah, uh, <laughs> Sujit, so, so where, are you, where are you now? What, where are you off to? Like Microsoft, all this, where are you going today? That sort of a thing. You know. okay, so where is Mintra going to? See, uh, business growth is not a big challenge for us, e-commerce as a sector in India, because there is, we still only scratch the surface from moving people from offline to online. So that is less uh, challenging. I think uh, what we've set for ourselves is, uh, two words is what we used to describe it, intuitive and immersive, right? Uh, see, the biggest problem with e-commerce, given all the convenience, everything is, it's extremely impersonal. Correct, because there is nobody who is having a conversation with you when you're buying. Uh, people like people. Uh, we, uh, so One in question, that world, how do you make you it said, more immersive into yeah, the You case. said about an uh, online fashion to fashion. So online fashion is online fashion. Fashion is, you're saying, the whole universe, isn't it? So how do you want to go into that? See, um, for example, there are certain codes to fashion, the way people, uh, all of us interact with fashion as a category. Uh, today, uh, all of us e-commerce guys are taking care of the transactional part of it, right? I'm giving you access to products, I'm giving you access to brands. Uh, am I helping you make the right fashion choice today? Probably not, often enough. There are sometimes I do that, there is not often enough, right? Fashion is a category where uh, you need inputs from others, you need social proofing. So with social media, the way it is going, uh, the ability for a platform like Mintra to leverage social media on a live basis is probably what's going to be big for us, right? Can I, before buying a jacket, probably show it to my best friend uh, and get his uh, opinion. opinion at that point in time? That probably drives the chance of a purchase significantly higher for me. So making it more intuitive and immersive, right? Uh, one thing we've already done, uh, many of you would see it, uh, today, if let's say, for example, if I open up my Mintra app and Nantakumar open up his Mintra app, it's going to be very different. 
because based on his past purchase, what is going to be shown to him, the customization, the personalization of what you experience, that becomes very important. So that's where we are moving in, which is where probably uh, technology becomes very important. Technology is very quiet in our world, but it probably drives almost everything that we do at the end of the day. So right. Say, right. Renish, where to now? Yeah, so every stage of our company, we had enough challenges okay. from moving from 100 people to 200, 200 to 500. So now, you know, the, the main problem we had faced in the past was the process, right? So when you have more people on the pro um, on the company, so you have a process issue. So now we set everything, so we... You're confident? Yeah, we are confident that, you know, we are ready for the next jump. So are there backers for you for doing that? No, we had... Um, funded uh, by one of the leading venture capitalists in 2014. Yep. Uh, and uh, yeah, we are looking for that. And uh, the, 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 the service company that you are, are you planning to get to anything, products or anything on solutions? Yeah, we do have solutions and we do have accelerators. Uh, okay. So specifically, um, maybe 30, 40% of revenues are coming from the uh, accelerators we sell. Great. Th that's something we have five minutes now. So, CB sir, what was your aha moment in life? In life or in work? Wherever. You, I think because an entrepreneur predominantly is work and life combined into one. I don't know. When my kids were born, probably. Okay. <laughs> and in business? Uh, business when we, uh, we pivoted when we were like 60, 70 million in revenues. And we made some changes to the business and suddenly took off. So that was, that that was, was a couple of great two years, yeah. Sandek. No, th this is the, you know, of course, if I take the whole spectrum of the thing and uh, if I pick up one moment, that was the first time I won the customer in, uh, uh, in Netherlands. In? In Netherlands. Okay. That was okay. First Netherlands. First Netherlands. That means outside India, that was my first. Which year was this? That was in 99 after five years of uh, failing in more than 30 odd bits. My goodness. So, King Bruce was repeated at least six times over, <laughs> actually. <laughs> huh? Okay. It took, it took for almost five, uh, 95 to uh, 99, I mean, to the, I mean, including both years. So, that was... Great thing. As far as Mintra was concerned, what was that aha moment of the career of Mintra, life of Mintra? See, I think uh, for us, the aha moment is probably something which happened uh, two years back for us, which is when a lot of international fashion brands coming into India, okay. uh, seeing us as the first partner to retail in India. Oh, that's right? great. So Mintra that's being considered the first, first partner with the fashion brands in the world. That's a big point for us. For great. Us. That's a great story, Anish. I had the aha moment, or is it in the coming, or it is already come? Yeah, we or? had one aha moment. Oh, lovely. Okay. Let's hear so about that. This was uh, maybe way back in 2013. So okay. we went to St. Albert's College and we conducted a freshers drive. Mm. And we offered to 35 people in one go. Okay. That was the, the first time we were giving... So, I mean, 35 was like big So many people so being many recruited people together, right? Together, yeah. It so must have given you some thumbs up, right? Like yeah, the so we, there were about 1,200 people came for the wow. drive. That was the, the biggest thing yeah. ever happened for us. Yeah. I could take a question or two maximum, and we have a small thing after that. Any question here? Right. So now we will call him the official questioner of this event, actually. <laughs> Um, we have a wonderful gathering on the stage here. It's very impressive to see all of you with brilliant ideas and blazing a trail, you know, in the scene of um, industry and entrepreneurship. I would request the audience to please rise up and join me in giving them a big hand. Wow, please. that's very great. You be seated. <laughs> Kindly rise. No, this is, this, is going to be, this is going to be state's future and the country's future. We must see. So these, maybe the Bill Gates, maybe the Laurie Ellison, maybe the Scott McNeely and maybe those like. Congratulations, gentlemen. I am so happy that I have been able to share this moment with you. Okay. Sir, yeah. my question yeah. is on the same lines. Yep. Um, that was just the remark part of it. The question here is, with all of you brilliant minds sitting on the stage here and all of you belonging to Kerala, when is it, I'm not saying whether, I'm saying when is it that Kerala, perhaps Cochin, maybe Trivandrum as well, um, will be the next Silicon Valley of the world, according to you? Yeah, who will take this? I think I'll give this question to Nandakumar because you're your representative of all of them put together. Yes. See, um, if you really look at uh, at least uh, Trivandrum, the number of product companies in that uh, space on compared to any other 
maybe uh, in the, what I call the density part of it is significantly high compared to many of the centers. So there is already an IP-based mindset there. Yes. Yeah, the big time. And the infrastructure also is coming up towards that. Actually. That's correct. So um, to me, I, I we would say I still feel uh, even after 29 years, still as a startup. So the potential is multi a, a billion dollar possibility. So anytime it can happen. So there is a possibility. Great. The so brace towards that. Now I will not take any more question. I will ask Mr. Dinesh uh, the, to come up to the stage. You will have a ponada with you. We missed uh, adorning a Ponada on our IT Leadership Award winner of the last year. So please join me in giving you a round of applause to Dinesh Thambi, President KMA, doing that honors on the IT Leadership Award. Okay. Right. And now we want your acceptance speech. All right. <laughs> I'll, uh, I'll stand here. Or I need to go. You can take the okay. lectern. So you can take the yeah, yeah. On behalf of our 2,500 employees, I accept this recognition. It's a great honor uh, to receive this recognition. I have been fortunate enough to get you know, so many awards uh, in, 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 in the US, but this is the first time I'm getting a recognition from my hometown. So this is uh, really memorable, and uh, thanks KMA. Thanks, Mr. S. R. Dyer and uh, Dinesh Tampi and all others who are instrumental in recognizing us. Uh, the good thing about recognizing entrepreneurs is that it, it kind of changes the culture of a community or a town or a city because uh, in future, uh, entrepreneurs can do a lot more than governments. If you look at the largest companies in the world, they are if you are two or three of the largest companies in the US, they are bigger than GDP of India. So companies are becoming like countries. And the influence of businesses are going to change the whole world. So encouraging entrepreneurship, encouraging entrepreneurs is amazing for a society like Cochin uh, here in Kerala. And I really, really uh, thank each one of you for attending it. Uh, and. Uh, Really, really appreciative of this recognition. Thanks again. Take care. That was short and, short and sweet. Yes, back to you, Mira. Yep. Thank you very much. Uh, that's, that's an exciting panel of uh, speakers. Yes, we would like to present a memento as a thank you. I request our moderator to do the honors. I'm sure there has been a few aha moments here too with the mentor and mentee sharing stage, a recognition that comes from the hometown that is very special. Thank you very much, Mr. Sibi Vadakekara, Mr. K. In Nanda Kumar. Yeah, Nanda Kumar, so you're, you're carrying twice. Okay, no problem. One you can keep. <laughs> <laughs> for being with us twice, for taking our questions, for taking your time. Mr. Sujit uh, Sudhagaran. Yes, for giving your uh, insights into the world of fashion. Thank you very much. And Mr. Rinish Kayan. They've all had uh, incredible backstories that will continue to motivate all of us. Thank you, gentlemen. Thank you all. And a big word of thank you to the moderator for giving the momentum, for propelling the discussion, for being spirited just as al always he is. Thank you very much. One big hand to the whole team here. We'll take just two minutes to set the stage for the uh, next session. Meanwhile, let me quickly thank our uh, sponsors. The diamond sponsor, the diamond partner is Lulu Tech Park Private Limited. Our silver sponsor, silver partner, our uh, Bharat Petroleum, Tata Consultancy Services and uh, Petronet LNG Limited. Bronze Partner, Manapuram Finance Limited, our supporters, Cochin Shipyard Limited, VGuard, and Sial. And we've partnered with Asianet News as our visual media partner. Our travel partner is Oman Air. Magazine partners being Dhanam, Passline, and Destination Kerala. The event would not have been possible without the tremendous contribution and support that the sponsors have given us. A big word 
A big shout out to all the sponsors. And now, ladies and gentlemen, we have come to the seventh, uh, to the eighth, uh, no, to the seventh session for the day. We've had marathon sessions. I am losing count. Uh, and it's a very interesting session, starting from an auto man to a cricket team coach. We have a spectrum of guests and speakers who are here today, who are not managers in the, by the definition, but who have excellent insights and values and inputs to offer to the managers here. So this is going to be a very exciting session and it is titled Coaching to Succeed. Any endeavor if it is being attempted for the first time, the need of a mentor or a coach is very paramount. So in the case, with cases where for long a team or a group have been indulging a lot, but have not reached the desired outcome, uh, how does coaching or mentoring remove the roadblock and create a new winning mindset to achieve success? So let us hear it from a person who instilled confidence in the Sri Lankan cricket team to win the World Cup before target timeline and who helped a not-so-cricket-centric Kerala team to reach the Renji Trophy semi-finals in the year 2009. And it's a joy to be inviting us for the session, Mr. Dave Watmore, the coach of the Kerala cricket team. I request our moderator, Mr. Madhav Chandran, the Vice President of KMA, to please escort him to the days. Mr. Madhav Chandran, welcome sir. And Mr. Madhav Chandran is the Managing Director of Cyberland Tech Limited Cochin, a partner at Transnet India and Executive Director at Linknet Solutions Private Limited. He's also served uh, as a marketing manager, Tata Consultancy Services and executive at HCL Limited Computer Division. He is a Rotary Governor of RI District 3201 for the year 2019-20. And having said that, I will pass on the floor to the moderator and the speaker. Thank you, Mira. Good afternoon, everybody. Thank you so much, uh, President Dinesh Thambi and Chairman Jibu Paul for giving me this rare opportunity of uh, sitting against one of the legends in the field of cricket. And that too when Australia is hammering India right now, 26 overs down and 154 for no loss. So we have got an Aussie sitting right across. He told me, you know, even though I am a very, very, uh, you know, quite visible person on the TV and all, I am not that good at giving such kind of speeches which we are soliciting from morning. So we will uh, provoke him. We will try to encounter him with some questions so that he'll feel free to talk. Now a word about him. Dave Watmore, born in Sri Lanka, in our own continent, but uh, moved out of Sri Lanka to Australia when the partition happened and, uh, you know, he's born to an English and Holland parents. Settled down in uh, Melbourne now. Played for Australia in uh, one day internationals as well as seven test cricket matches. More so for playing for Victoria, he has scored more than 6,000 odd runs. But he came to the limelight as far as we are concerned because we have seen him creating some magic in the cricket field. The not so winning style of uh, Sri Lanka was turned around sometime back when some bunch of youngsters there, the names I, I'm sure he will mention, were turned around into superstars, made them win the Cricket World Cup, went on to coach Bangladesh, the so-called minnows of world cricket into giant killers that they killed Australia in their own courtyard, defeated India, where they had a national party actually celebrating that victory uh, in the World Cup itself in 2007. And uh, how many of you have uh, forgotten that sight of Virat Kohli being that aggressive youngster exulting in front of the defeated team as an under-19 captain and there was this man behind him as a coach. I don't know whether he made him do that or whether he stopped him from doing that. And of course, in India, he was also part of the National Cricketing Academy where he, where he uh, you know, was, a, was heading it for two years. And now coming down to Kerala, we all think that you know, we are all such good guys, great guys, but when in, when in a team, we never realize that you know, the team playing spirit is of utmost importance. That could be the reason why Kerala team in Ranjis were never considered as a formidable team. But this year, we reached up to the semi-final and knocked out there only. And the likes of Basil Thambi and the Sandeeps and uh, you know, the Sachin uh, of Kerala you know, came to limelight as team players. Again, the head coach being Dave Watmore. Here he is with us, 
playing for Australia, coaching for the world, sitting in front of us. Let me ask him a simple question to begin with. How did you transform yourself from a player to a coach? Thank you, Madhav. Um, before I answer that, if I stand up a little bit, please. Um, before I answer that, uh, can I first of all say um, how very pleased and privileged uh, I am to be here um, in the company of some really high flyers, I have to tell you, and um, I had to deal with this bloody butterfly in my stomach. <laughs> Um, so I hope I don't drop the odd swear word as we go along. I've been stimulated uh, already and uh, I've learnt a couple of things and I know already what I want to do with a, in a couple of areas with the team next year. Uh, I've been frightened by the sort of technology that I've been hearing. Uh, I, can, I can email, I can send an attachment, uh, I can uh, get on Twitter and Instagram <laughs> but some of the stuff you guys have been talking about is really frightening me. Um, so I've been, uh, I've been duly impressed with a whole range of things here. Um, but getting close to, uh, getting, close, getting back to the question that you asked, um, I don't know, I, I guess um, I've been extremely fortunate um, to take on the pathway of a, of a cricket coach um, these, in the last so many years I can think of, if a player wants to become a coach, and he doesn't have to have been a player, there are uh, levels coaching A, B and C, level A, level B and level C. Level C is very intense, very, uh, it's very difficult to get. And there was not levels A, B and C when I started. I was extremely fortunate enough to, uh, to be given the opportunity to be the head coach of a Institute of Sport program in Victoria, which means, what does that mean? I mean, there's, you know, all these Olympic sports who, uh, who got big funding. And cricket, which really pissed off a few people because cricket anyway earns a lot of money through uh, Cricket Australia and all that. But they were given also a big chunk of money to develop uh, the sport. So I became a head coach in the cricket program alongside all these other um, gold medal Olympic coaches. And so what do I do? I thought, well, I'll just do to the scholarship holders, which were 15 or so. There was about 12 guys and three girls. Uh, what was done to me? And I soon learned that was not the way to go. My program manager gave me the absolute, you know what's. He's saying, you've got to think laterally, son. You can't do the things that was done for years on end. How do you think laterally? I, I'm a bit dumb, you know, like... But I tell you, the place that I learnt the most is having a cappuccino downstairs next door to the office where all the coaches came with a cigarette. St sorry to say it, I was a smoker those days, not now, not for the last 20 odd years. And listening, learning and talking to these other coaches, these gold medal winning coaches. And they used to really kid me saying, ah, oh, cricket's not a sport, you know. So I used to defend the game and uh, we had a lot of fun doing it, but slowly, slowly, slowly over the years you learn how to become a coach. And that basically means how to, um, how to organise an athlete's 12-month annual plan. When do you do the sort of training you do? And it's all built around competition. So if you know your competition dates, then it becomes a little bit easier. Over time, you learn this, when to start programming different things in. When do you become specific training? When do you become, uh, begin to do the, the basic stuff? All these little things count. And my role then was um, before school or before uh, college, six o'clock to eight o'clock, and then again after school, after college, between four and six in the evening. So in the middle, what do I do? There was a speaker every day that would come to the institute and talk on all sorts of different things. So I had a sandwich, coffee, sit in the back of the room and listen. I learned about underwater hockey. Never knew there was underwater hockey. I listened to all sorts of different sports that uh, gave me the opportunity to build up a huge bank of knowledge. And over four years, as I said, it just, it just have so much knowledge, but no team, 
Never had a team. We used to have a little bit of a practice uh, matches because the, the, the scholarship holders were obviously playing for a club, but we didn't play as an institute of sport. But we had some pre-season stuff that we helped because we had some money to spend, but never had a team. And then the opportunity came in 1995 when one of the, uh, the representatives from the Sri Lanka cricket um, was asked by the, the, by the board, is there anybody in Australia that can do a job that Bob Simpson did for Australia? And Simo is the best coach, period, in my mind. Shit, this guy said, what about Dave Watmore, <laughs> you know? So that's how it all started. It, I had a lot of negotiation and I finally accepted a position uh, for two years with Sri Lankan cricket in 1995 and that's how it began. Great. Would you like to sit and talk or? Uh, yeah, that's fine. Then I'll also sit. sit, and stand up. sit <laughs> Thank you so much. I don't think he's a man of few words. I think he can, he can really, really uh, strike up a good, good presentation and talk on uh, the topic coaching to succeed. Well, coming to the coaching part, we in India are uh, well aware of all those gurus or mentors as we call them right now from time immemorial, whether it's Ramayana or Mahabharata, we had coaches there, uh, the, the Dronas and the Bhishmas and all kinds of people. Uh, well, uh, cricketing world actually got the coaches or the coaching system uh, very late. In fact, football and rugby and all had coaches uh, for a long, long time. But then only in the 80s, the coaches came into being for cricket. But if you look at cricket, cricket and uh, the business management, you know, that as a team, if you look at it, a lot of similarities are there. Now, what is the relevance of coaching actually in today's uh, cricketing world? Let's start from there. What do you think is the relevance of coaching? The levels? Relevance, relevance oh, of coaching. The, 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 the relevance. Yeah, I'm sure that uh, over the years, a lot of people have seen some similarities between uh, a, a team sport, in my case, cricket, and applying it to business uh, to see those businesses grow as well. So um, we, in my, uh, in, in my sport, of course, it's a, there's, you need a skill, but as a coach, you're working with people. And because you're working with human beings, and they're not machines, then you need to understand a few fundamentals, that, that people are different. Sure, they all walk out on the field with the same cap, and they all want to uh, do well for themselves, but you're playing as a team. So in, in, in order to develop success in that team, a number of things you need to know none of which I think you should be a, you know, an absolute um, expert in, but as a coach you need to be aware of a lot of these, well, I call them jigsaw puzzle pieces. If the jigsaw puzzle pieces fit nicely, you got a good picture. So it's the, the, un the base understanding of people are different along with the nutrition, the biomechanical, the, that's the technical part of it, uh, the tactical part of it. Um, all sorts of other little things that, that come into um, an individual that if he is very warm in his feeling, that he knows that the coach has a duty of care um, and he's given a task, a challenge that he's got a good chance of achieving, then you've got something special happening. So. Understanding that a player, um, like you try to fit a square peg in a square hole, a round peg in a round hole. You don't ask somebody to do a job that you, you know hasn't got a good chance of achieving. Um, lots of other little things that come into it, you know, the, the environment has to be positive. Unless you have a positive environment, ain't going to work. So those things, I can tease them out later if you like, but those are the things that um, I feel that I, that's worked for me uh, with the teams that I've been working with uh, to give performance and more importantly, consistent performance. Well, it's all about man management and mind management and creating a positive uh, environment around them yeah. is what you're trying to say. But uh, as you all know, he has been rated one among the top five cricket coaches in the world, you know, with the Gary Christians and the John Bishan, and he's there. And if you Google it, you can see the top five coaches is, is right up there among all those uh, other four people, you know, Gary Bushan and, uh, you know, John Wright and, the, you know, and all those people are there. Um, you heard about uh, him pulling out the best from Sri Lanka. 
taking Bangladesh to a different level altogether, and now Kerala, and of course Virat Kohli, the find under 19. What do you think is your secret behind that success? Um, just getting back to Kerala, because that's more um, relevant here um, in Cochin. Um, before I took the job, and I, I do need to thank the, um, the Kerala Cricket Association for having the confidence in me, TC and um, J.S. George, to offer me this position. Um, I knew that the group of players that they had were pretty decent. And um, that was you had something to work with. So we, I think two things, really, uh, when I look back in the very short period of time I had with, uh, with Kerala. One was the preparation. We needed to prepare as well as we can because um, if you jump into a season running rather than stumbling into it, then it's a huge advantage. If you can hit the ground running and earn points. When you play in the league phase, it doesn't matter if you lose, but you've got to win as well. So important to hit the ground running and start winning and, and start to accrue your points. So I felt that we possibly, you know, were as, as good a, uh, as well as anybody, any other team, we prepared as well as we could have. And that in, included a couple of things that they've never done before. So the preparation phase was to be as specific as you can to the format of the game that you're going to play. In this, in this case, my first uh, assignment was Runji Trophy, four-day cricket. So we had to recreate um, the same, um, as close as possible, the same pressure, uh, the same sort of scenarios as you would find when you enter into competition. So that was good. And the other thing was, sounds a bit silly, we played games. We played stupid games. <laughs> Everyone before each match had the job to entertain the team. And I'm talking musical chairs. I played that as a kid. Musical chairs. We had all sorts of... A couple of games are horrible, I couldn't tell you. Very suggestive. We had the last game that they played. I think Akshay Chandran was given the job with his mate. I don't know, it could have been Sanju. Two teams in pairs they had to run 10 metres and then there was two single stumps. They had to hold the stump and run 10 times around the stump with your head down and then run back. Can you imagine? After even two rounds, you're all over the place like a drunken whatever. And it was just funny just to see the guys stumble and fall over when they were trying to complete a simple task. But playing games... They seem a bit silly, but it really bonded the guys together. And it was really wonderful to see the smiles on their face. Um, I, I this year produced those little smiley badges. If you don't smile, you don't play in this team, <laughs> sort of thing. So, you know, that was, I think, significant in being able to bind them together. Yeah, being happy together is uh, yeah. the key to success. And of course, we have seen that, you know, when the Kerala team, the same captain was struggling with uh, many star players under them and somebody, some people talking about removing the captain, changing somebody else. And then with the same team, same composition, the coach changed and things have started changing. Of course, that could be the key to your success there. Well, uh, just going back to the Australian scene, you know, they, they've, uh, they've been good at one thing, which uh, even Cyril Gavaskar, Sachin Tendulkar, everybody has seen, that is sledging. And uh, now this year, when uh, India visited Australia, you got a similar dose from this side also. What is the transformation which you find, which has happened in India, you know, when uh, the Virat Kohli and the bunch of guys going there, and they were actually accused of sledging? Yeah, very slowly, the Indian uh, cricket team, very slowly, over a period of time, has become a group that is not prepared to take um, this sort of sledging anymore. And it takes a strong leader to lead the way. Just like we had Arjuna Ranatunga way back in the mid-90s to late 90s, you got a guy called Virat Kohli who doesn't give a damn. And he's got so much confidence in his own ability and that flows on to the rest of the team that it almost becomes a, a just a force shield around you. That, you know, you, you just, nothing's penetrable. And very slowly over time, 
uh, they've been able to stand up to all this sort of nonsense that uh, goes on in the West. And who says that's the way to play cricket? Australia for many years used to, you know, be the bully. And they talk about this line, this imaginary line, we don't cross over the line. What? I'd love to know what that bloody line is. <laughs> they, talk, they keep talking about it, but they don't like to be matched. And slowly and slowly this team in India is now standing up and more than that, they're getting better at the opposition. And you've seen evidence of this, uh, you know, with the body language, um, some of the stuff that comes on the stump mics uh, <laughs> is, uh, uh, reflects a very confident um, Indian cricket team. And I think Virat Kohli is the one that should, you know, is leading the way with that. It's all about confidence and the leadership also. Mm. Well, you mentioned a, a word about uh, Arjuna Ranatunga. If I may, if I may intrude a bit into uh, some of the stories in the Sri Lanka and the world media. When you were at the peak of glory, you know, winning the World Cup and having a great team being set up by you as a coach and uh, Ranatunga as a captain, there were a lot of uh, rumors roaming around about the friction which was going on. And uh, that's, that's a very common thing which happens even in the corporate parlays. You know, if you look at it, the high echelons, we have got so much of politics and who is getting the credit, who is doing that, who is really the reason for it. Those kind of questions asked in, uh, in management parlays too. How did you uh, face those stress situations? If it was stress for you or uh, did you take it in your stride? Um, not too much stress, I have to say. Um, look, Arjuna, um, maybe uh, maybe a surprise for, for a lot of you, but he was a lot more democratic than you think. Uh, sure, he was a very strong character. He really did support uh, his team. Um, he had a, a decent knowledge of tactical, um, in the tactical area. Um, and he was very open to suggestions, which may surprise some of you. But at the same time, the same man was very strong in also standing up to opposition um, and standing up to the cricket board as well on occasions. Um, yeah, he, uh, we, we crossed a little bit um, over, the, over my short time there. Um, the main area really was that um, after the World Cup victory, I knew that there are a lot of other teams in the world that want to catch up to us. That we, so in order for us to remain there, let alone get better, that we have to work harder. And unfortunately, some of the, uh, the training sessions that occurred not long after the, the World Cup victory, a lot of players went missing. Uh, they come up with all different excuses why they couldn't be there. And I got really, really pissed off, to be honest with you. Um, I had a small holiday. I went to England. I gave a, uh, a, a, an interview to um, the Sunday Times there. And the fellow wrote, but it, luckily he only quoted me in a couple of areas. I came back to Sri Lanka. I was asked to come to, this, uh, to the president's house for a chat. Walked in there and there was a group of, I don't know, seven or eight people around a table. The president got this, piece, this paper and he threw it on the coffee table and said, explain. Sheesh. <laughs> That's not a very uh, pleasant environment to, uh, <laughs> to be in. Uh, but talk my way out of it a little bit, but I was the, my way of telling the players, listen, you do your work because we need to work harder in order for us to maintain that high standard. But very slowly after that, I was gagged. I couldn't talk to the press. I, could, I had to take permission for everything that I did. So I felt that I wasn't wanted. And within four months, I left. I left well before the end of my first contract. Um, that's the sort of person, if I don't feel that I'm needed, off I go. It doesn't matter if you won the World Cup or not. So I left and went to Lancashire and uh, had a couple of years in county cricket. But Arjuna, um, look, he's got a lot of good traits, very big family man at the time. Um, worked pretty hard, as you might think, but unfortunately his body type, a little bit like mine, not very um, easy to, to remain or to get fit. There are other people with different body types can eat anything they like, not one kilo will they put on. So unfortunately, uh, you know, for him, he had to always watch his weight like I had to, um, and he worked hard. And that's probably a reflection why he didn't get enough, as many hundreds as he probably could have. Simply because when you get tired, fatigue sets in, concentration is broken, and you generally lose your wicket. 
So, uh, but Arjuna, look, I have to say a lot of good things with him. He's, on, he's a great politician then. He's even a, he's a minister in the, politi in the ruling <laughs> thank government you for that, now. Thank you for that candid expression about the relationship with uh, Arjuna. But uh, before we uh, ask one or two questions from the audience, let me just ask one question or rather request you to say one line as an advice to all these managers and the management students sitting here. Uh, they're all supposed to be managing human minds and human beings, you know. What is that one line which you would say to get the best out of your teams? Wow. Um, difficult in one sentence. Um, I think maybe if I had to, three words. Duty of care. If you, if you show everybody that you really care about that individual and you have a real interest in improving that individual, it doesn't have to be specifically that work. It could be something totally divorced from it. But that person knows you care. So I think a duty of care would be something that I always will want uh, you know, people to remember me by. Great. This man is a very warm personality. I must say that we all look up to Australians as the rough, hard fighting fighters you know i was talking to him for the last 10 minutes he was talking about the 38 years of his marriage and you know uh, enjoying his life with his wife and the two children he has one in melbourne uh, running a and yeah, one in, in england and england. i still yeah cock it up you know the communication bit i always prefer you know talk about communicate gotta communicate 38 years coming up and i still make errors i ex I, I, ex I think she knows what i'm thinking and she doesn't. And then, you know, when you're on the phone or you got that WhatsApp video, oh, shit, I did, didn't I tell you that? Oh, sorry. And a little bit of a, you know, luckily uh, she stuck by me, allowed me to, to live my dream for 38 years. Would you like to mention that about your son too? Because I was seeing that heart in him, the large heart. He said his son is in the <laughs> UK and uh, running a trauma ambulance service there. And he said, you know, he does not play, but he does something much, much greater than that. He can't catch, he can't throw, he can't kick. <laughs> but he's got the best heart I've ever seen in a kid. And I love him. I miss him so much. Wow, that's really great. I, I really admire you because being in Rotary, you know, I can understand the values of that service to mankind is all about. Wow. Now, we have a question here. Uh, who has written that? Uh, Jaren Jose from SB College. He says, sir, you are the man behind Sri Lanka's maiden World Cup victory. I think that's enough to describe you. I'm also mentioning you, uh, your recent guiding of Kerala to their first ever Renji Trophy semi-final. Yes, we said that. Unfortunately, we lost. And my first question is, I know you are a change maker. How can you be able to make these changes in such a short time with a low-performing team? I think, uh, well, uh, low-performing team, yes. But then I think he has already answered that question in between. Next question, he is uh, asking, how is your cricket academy center for sports center in Chennai going on? And I would like to work with you, sir. Can I get an internship? <laughs> <laughs> anyway, you can, you can just uh, explain about your cricket academy stint too, sir. Uh, that'll cost, uh, summer camp cost, I think, uh, 24,000 rupees. <laughs> um, but they get a lot for it. Um, look, the, the, I was more or less headhunted, I guess, over a period of 12 months towards the end of my international coaching career and um, the timing was was right for me to come back into development um, so I said okay and uh, we we agreed uh, on some terms that I would um, be domiciled in Chennai at the Sri Ramachandra Institute of Higher Education and Research and during the domestic Indian season um, I would work with the Kerala um, cricket team as their head coach. Uh, it was a, a terrific little marriage um, and I was very pleased to keep my finger on the pulse as it were with team coaching, um, albeit on a seasonal basis there's no continuum like international uh, cricket coaching and then also to have my own uh, Watmore Centre for Cricket where we provide um, you know tuition to, uh, to anybody who wished to come along. And more so, you know, our academy is, is really in the every essence of the word correct, academy. A lot of people call their cricket practice academies. But in this case, we have a, you know, centre for sports science. Uh, we have, um, we offer and deliver uh, lots of theoretical sessions. Because a lot of kids can learn a little bit of stuff on, you know, practically in the nets. But to come in the classroom 
watch images and, uh, and listen to the, the theory of uh, different skills uh, makes a bit of a difference. So yeah, we're, we're very happy that we've got a very important and very um, uh, three months, intense three months coming up in the summer camp. Um, and after that it dies down a little bit, but um, that's, my, that's my life. That's great. It was uh, really, really uh, great interacting with such a warm personality, multifaceted personality. And uh, because of positive time, I'm not able to, I can see some hands raising here and there, but we are not taking any, any more questions now. We can take him offline. He's going to be here for some more time, I'm sure. Thank you so much, Dave, for that uh, lovely interaction. And you were, you were a real sport in answering all those questions. And you were really good at speaking. So don't worry about that. Don't have any butterflies anymore. Thank you all. And uh, over to the MC. Thank you. Thank you very much, sir. And now we would like to present the memento. Irek was the moderator to present the memento as a thank you to our speaker. Such a warm person. He spoke from his heart. Some very honest expressions. If you really care for your team members, your team will definitely succeed. That's the message to carry back home. And uh, please do convey our warmest greetings to your family. Thank you very much for joining us. Thank you. Thank you. And ladies and gentlemen, this is the last lap of the run. We are quickly moving to the valedictory session. We have some of our stalwarts who are joining us for the valedictory session. Let me also remind you, the winner will also be declared. We'll be finding the lucky winner in the valedictory uh, session. That is to start right now. Let me just take this time to present the theme, Managing Work, Managing Life, the Global Aspirations of Young India. India has some real advantages going in her favor. favor. It's one of the largest, one of the fastest growing economies of the world, one of the largest markets in the world, and it has the demographic dividend. In comparison to the global plovers, India is a relatively young nation with an average age of, age of the citizen around 29 years, in which close to 60% is below 25 years. So the population of the youth in India almost equals to the population of the European continent. The young India is very aspirational and is looking beyond the country's borders to work, to do business, to live and to grow. With age on their side and soft power competencies going along with it, the young Indian feels his time has arrived. While goods and services are allowed full flow through the nations, the movement of people across borders is greatly restricted. While it dampens the enthusiasm, young Indian must be looking out for opportunities around the world, particularly those required in an aging, developed world. So towards this, young India must build up the competencies, skills, behavior, and communications to meet up the requirement of the discerning nations. So in a scenario like this, many questions pop up. What are all the competencies and behaviors required to meet the demands of the aging world? How does India's youth gain traction with the world? How do we manage our life and our work in the emerging high technology world? What are the catalysts required to make young India's cause come true? How does a young Indian prepare to be part of the world order? I'm sure the speakers will navigate through these difficult terrains at the valedictory session. Yes, I think I will start the valedictory function. It's indeed a delight and a privilege to be hosting as our chief guest, Padma Bhushan B. Muthuraman, the former vice chairman of Tata Steel Limited and former chairman of Tata International. May I request you, sir, to please take the chair. I request Mr. Dinesh Tambi, the president of KMA, to escort our chief guest to the stage. A very warm welcome to you. And joining us today as our guests of honor are Mr. Richard Bukov, the President of Air Products USA. I request Mr. Jibu Paul, the Senior Vice President and the Convention Chair, to accompany him to the stage. Also, our guest of honor is Dr. Saji Gopana, the CEO of Kerala Startup Mission. May I request Mr. V. George Anthony, our Honorary Secretary, to accompany our guests to the stage. A word of welcome to the gentlemen on stage. I request Mr. Vibhu Punnuran, the convention convener, honorary joint secretary, uh, to also be a part of the guests here on stage. <laughs> 